Browser caching is one of the most powerful yet often misunderstood tools for improving web performance. Web performance matters more than ever these days. It affects user experience, conversion rates, and can even impact your ranking and search results. Among all the optimization techniques out there, I would absolutely treat browser caching as a low hanging fruit. But what exactly is browser caching? Simply put, when you load a website, your browser saves files like JavaScript, CSS, and images as if on a folder on your desktop. Not literally a folder, but you can imagine a folder on your desktop for the sake of this example. The next time you visit that site, instead of downloading all those files again, the browser simply serves them from its local cache, that folder on your desktop, and it makes the page load a lot faster. If a first visit to a website takes, let's say five seconds to load, a repeat visit could take even less than one second to load with caching en enabled. And a little pro tip for you, caching isn't just useful for repeat visits, because many CDNs will cache your site's assets on their edge servers. That is servers which are close to the user that is requesting the site or the file in question. So caching is good for both first time visits and repeat visits. Caching is controlled through HTTP response headers, but before we dive into that, let's quickly understand what HTTP response headers are. They are basically little bits of information sent by a server along with the requested file, and it gives the browser guidance or instructions on how to handle that file including how long to cache it. The most important header for caching is the cache control header. And I want to run through a few techniques with you that you can use to start caching your files and resources on your website. For files that will never change, like a logo or maybe even a CSS file, use the cache control header. And for the value to the cache control header, use multiple directives. That is a max age with a length of time in seconds. In this case, that's the number of seconds in a year and then also use the immutable directive. This tells the browser cache this file for one year and don't bother checking if it's changed. This works really well for resources like your main.js file or your main.css file or a logo.png. However, you're probably wondering what happens when you do need to change those resources? What happens when your main.js file gets updated? How does that update get delivered to the user if you've just cached the resource for a year? And this is where asset versioning is absolutely critical to making this all work. Instead of updating the resource at that URL that we just spoke about, like the main.js file, what you're going to do is create a brand new resource like main-v1 or main-v2.js, which is essentially a brand new URL. You can then go into your index.html file or whatever HTML file in question is that references the main.js file, and you can update that URL. So you turn it from main.js to main-v1.js. And at this point, the browser treats it as a completely new file to download and you get the best of both worlds because you're able to cache resources for a really long time. But when they're updated, it's pretty trivial to force the browser to download that new resource. And in case you're feeling like it's gonna be a massive pain that every time you update those files, you need to turn it into v1, v2, v3, and so on, don't worry, that's a completely automated process. And it can go by a few terms like asset fingerprinting or asset revisioning or asset versioning. The important part is not the terminology given to this technique, but it's the fact that most modern build tooling web frameworks do support this out of the box. It's supported in Rails and Next.js. Many front-end orientated asset pipelines can also tackle this. Now that was one extreme, an asset which could be cached for a really long time. But let's talk about an asset which might not want to be cached at all. For example, if my website had no caching and I was trying this stuff out for the first time, I probably wouldn't want to cache my HTML file. Not only because it could get updated, but also because it references resources, which as I mentioned previously, might be cached for up to a year. And it would be too big of a risk to encounter situations where I've updated my static assets and they've got their brand new file names, but I can't actually update my HTML file because it's referring to outdated assets that maybe don't even exist anymore. A starting point for HTML documents or other resources which change so regularly you can't really afford to cache them. You can use the usual cache control header, but use a directive of no dash cache. However, confusingly, this doesn't mean don't cache this file or this resource. What it actually means is you can cache it, but make sure to revalidate with the server every time before using it. And if you're hearing that term for the first time, revalidation, it's basically when the browser checks with the server to see if the cache version is still valid. If you definitely want zero caching, the directive that you want is no dash store. So that's cache control colon no dash store. And that HTTP response header will tell browsers and CDNs not to cache this resource at all. Let's continue. We've just discussed two interesting extremes. The first example is where you wanted to cache assets 
permanently or for a very long time. And then the second example was where you want to cache resources almost not at all. But those are the simpler of examples to give. There's a reason they say that cache invalidation is one of the hardest problems in computer science. It's because of the more nuanced approaches, which is in between those two extremes that we just discussed. For example, what happens when it's a file that might change occasionally, where a slightly outdated version is acceptable for a very short time, be it 10 seconds, 10 minutes, 10 hours, whatever. I'll jump into the header or headers that you're going to see in a second, and then I'll explain what they do. You want to start out with cache control with a max age of 10, for example, and I'm just using that 10 purely for illustrative purposes. And then you want to tack on the must-revalidate directive. So that's cache control, max age of 10, with a must-revalidate directive. And then importantly, you want to add an e-tag. Now an e-tag is just another HTTP header, and it gives a way for the server to tell the browser what version of the resource this is, and you'll see why that's useful in a second. When you use these headers from the server to the browser, what they tell the browser is that you can cache this file for 10 seconds, and after that window, you must check with the server before using it again. But what's really nice is within that first 10 second window, the browser doesn't even have to go over to the network. So this is where a large resource that maybe was taking one second to download previously is now ready for the user in a matter of milliseconds. Equally as interesting is after those 10 seconds, the resource goes from a fresh resource to a stale resource. And you would think that with a stale resource, the browser will just get rid of it straight away. But what the browser can actually do is it can tell the server, hey, I've got this potentially outdated resource. Here's the version that you gave me for this resource. And the version in this example is v1. The server can look at the version that it has. And in an ideal scenario, the server says, you know what? You actually have the latest version of that resource. So I'm going to send you a 304 not modified status. And I'm going to completely skip serving of the response body which in some cases will save a lot of bandwidth from being transferred over the network, which could lead to actual cost savings. But more importantly, it means the user doesn't have to download and waste their bandwidth since they already have that resource on their device. Just like we saw previously with asset versioning, these V1s or V2s and so on, most modern web servers can handle these out of the box. They can compute the relevant e-tag for your resource and can make sure to send that down to the browser. And don't forget what we spoke about earlier, this could even be suitable for a CDN if you're using one. Now the max age of 10 or whatever figure you find suitable with a must revalidate directive could be good for resources which get periodically updated, but you can't afford to show a stale resource. It, it might be an API endpoint which gets the weather forecast. If you happen to know that there are some weather stations which only update every 10 seconds or 10 minutes or whatever it is, you can use that to your advantage to really come up with a strong caching strategy. Here's a little bonus for you. For an even better user experience, send that usual cache control header down where you have the max age of 10 or whatever number you deem is appropriate for your resources. And instead of must-revalidate, use stale while revalidate. But that directive isn't used on its own. You can pass a figure to it. You can assign an actual value to it in seconds, like five. And what this directive that we're looking at now tells the browser, if the content is less than 10 seconds old, serve it from the cache immediately. No network request is needed. If the content is between 10 and 15 seconds old, serve the stale version from the cache, but fetch an updated version in the background. A network request is made, but the server might respond with a 304 not modified, which means it's as fast of a network request as you're going to get. However, if the content is over 15 seconds old, that's the max age plus the stale while revalidate figure, then you must wait for a fresh version from the server. So this pattern gives you the best of both worlds and it's really the pattern that I would advise you explore if you can use it yourself. If you can afford for a stale resource to be displayed to the user for a very short period of time, then go ahead and do that. What I really like about this approach is the fact that a check is made, but it's made asynchronously. The browser is still happy to show and present that stale version of the resource to the user and you as a website owner or website developer can be sure that at least on the next visit, they will be presented with the fresh version of that resource, assuming there is a fresh version. Remember, it's always possible that the server turns around and says, you already have the freshest version of that resource. Just like with the previous example that you saw, don't forget to use an e-tag if you are using this technique of stale while revalidate. Just a few very quick tips for implementing caching on your own website and resources. There are tons of caching directives all suiting very specific and interesting use cases, I've only really scratched the surface in this video. 
If you want to learn more about caching strategies and other directives which you can use in those HTTP response headers, go and read the blog post I wrote about this, which I'll link to in the description. Another tip is to always test your caching strategy in different browsers to ensure that it works as expected. For example, I'm pretty sure that DevTools has a little disable cache checkbox, so you can use that toggle caching on and off to make sure that your website is working as expected. Another tip is that if you're using a CDN, understand that CDNs have their own caching layers and sometimes behaviors. They may respect the caching headers you provide, but they may also ignore it. That's why it's best to read the documentation. For the most part, CDNs tend to work fairly intuitively, but every now and then you might encounter some very aggressive caching behavior, so you just need to be mindful of that. My final tip and recommendation for you is to actually test this stuff with real user monitoring tools like Debug Bear to make sure that your caching strategy is working correctly in the real world. Lab tests are useful, synthetic tests are useful, and using your own developer machine is useful to an extent, but real user monitoring tools can tell you with more certainty what percentage of your users are getting cached versions of resources. That's it for now. Thanks for watching. Drop any questions you have in the comments below.